Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks to everybody who survived to the last talk of the first day. Uh, I, uh, I barely can stay awake myself, but hopefully I can last another uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about dependent partitioning. Um, this is uh, work done at Stanford uh, in, a, in a group that works on the Legion parallel programming model, uh, which is designed for distributed systems. And so we think an awful lot about partitioning um, uh, for our applications. And the main reason we do this is that partitioning of data is absolutely critical uh, when you're writing a program for a distributed system. Um, it exposes the available parallels in, in the system. You need to be able to find work to do on all the different uh, processors in your system. And uh, they're going to need to operate on different data. So you need to be able to do that. And the other thing is there's inevitably going to be communication in any kind of distributed application, but you want to be able to minimize that data movement. If I can describe what data things are using, I can better minimize, better move precisely what's needed um, for a given computation to the place that's uh, going to do this. Um, so if partitioning is so important, you would like to have language support for it, and you would like your language support to be very expressive. I'd like to be able to talk about structured data, like arrays and matrices and stuff, but also unstructured data, graphs and trees and all that. Um, I'd like to be able to do multiple partitions, and I'd like the partitions to be application specific. Uh, I'd like to be able to describe exactly the partition of the given data that makes sense for my application. Um, I would also like the uh, partitioning to be efficient and, and scalable. So it needs to run fast, and if I uh, make my problem size bigger on a bigger machine, I need it to stay fast. Uh, I would like it to be easy to use. I'm, you know, this is stuff I'm adding to the, the program. I don't want to be typing forever. I don't want it to be uh, difficult to understand. And then finally, um, hopefully uh, folks in the crowd will agree with me that you'd like to be verifiable. I'd like to actually be able to check for errors before I run my gigantic job and have it crash on me or generate, you know, unexpected data. Um, and so hopefully none of these are too controversial. Uh, and I will tell you right now that basically none of the existing uh, languages that provide support for partitioning are going to give you all this. Um, however, uh, dependent partitioning will. Uh, and Critically, we've done it in a way that's designed to actually be incorporated into existing languages. We're not, we're not, I'm not trying to sell you a new language today. I'm trying to sell you a framework that we're going to be able to fold into existing languages to provide these benefits uh, um, for existing distributed systems. So before I tell you about how a dependent partitioning is going to solve all the problems, let me tell you about your, your current choices. Uh, and they basically come in two categories. Uh, one extreme that you have right now is basically the simple model. Uh, and this is common pretty much of all the PGAS languages. Uh, so Chapel, X10, UPC, I could keep going. Uh, I'm going to show you a little Chapel syntax for now. Uh, I don't, raise your hand if you've ever used Chapel. One, awesome. <laughs> it means you can check my syntax. Uh, okay, so this is, this is um, not a whole Chapel program, but it basically just shows how you declare uh, data, and I'm going to show you how you uh, partition and distribute it in Chapel. So Chapel has this notion of domains, which are um, basically, uh, I can have two-dimensional domains, so X is a 2D domain and Y is a 1D domain. This just describes the bounds of these arrays that I'm going to create down here. So F and G, uh, this syntax for F basically means it's an array, it's a 2D array because X is a 2D domain and each element of the array is a real. And then G here is uh, an array, uh, it's a 2D array again, where each element is an int, and I've got the handy little comment here that says what's actually going on here is G is going to be referring to an index in Y, uh, which happens to be a one-dimensional thing, so we'll just use an int. Um, and so this is great. This is, um, most PGAS languages provide you a kind of a global view of things, and so this is, this is the global view, but now I need to partition it. Now I need to, uh, in, in um, chapel speak, I need to domain map it onto my system so that I can have it run in a distributed fashion and actually get me scalable performance. And Chapel makes this very simple. I just drop in after domain. I can say dmapped block, which means chop it up into coarse blocks and distribute it around the machine. That's not too bad. Uh, I can do dmapped cyclic, which means uh, round robin the elements over all the domains. Um, or, you know, I can have kind of an in-between thing, block cyclic. So make blocks of some size and then round robin those around the machine. Um, and that's basically your choices. So. Hopefully you'll agree this is relatively easy to use. It's easy to build an array. It's easy to pick one of my three domain mappings and, uh, and map it around. Uh, it happens to also be uh, very good for performance. There's almost no overhead to doing this in these languages. Uh, it scales very well. Uh, basically, every, every node knows exactly what piece it owns, and life is good. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, kind of limited in expressibility. Uh, we've only got structured data. We've only got three ways to partition data. Um, you know, I can come up with examples for which this is a perfect fit, but I can come up with many more examples for which it's 
not a great fit at all. Um, and the other thing we have here is no ability to verify it. So, um, you know, it's kind of a bad sign when the thing that says that G is referring to Y is a comment. You're pretty sure the compiler is not going to pick up on that. Okay, so if I partition X and Y in different ways, there's just no way that the compiler is going to tell me if I've done that in a way where the corresponding piece of Y is not in the same place as the corresponding piece of X. Um, but, you know, this is what almost all the existing languages do today, and it's basically because of those first two bullet points. It's easy to use and it's fast. And especially in the you know, high performance com uh, computing community, if it's fast and not horrible to use, you're basically done. Um, but we can do better. Um, so let me talk about trying to do better. And uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about what we tried to do with Legion, which is going after this expressive expressivity uh, problem. How do we let people actually express the partitions they want in the hope that this will result in um, more easier to write programs, better performance because data movement can be minimized, all those good things. And I'm going to try to do this pictorially because it's hard to, it's hard to describe expressivity in words. And so what I'm going to show you is the way that uh, a Legion program that operates on an unstructured graph tends to look. And so here's my graph. It's got nodes and edges. And let's say I want to partition this up into, uh, into three pieces. I'm going to run on three different nodes. Um, and so what you do in Legion is you, you talk about all your nodes. And this was an electrical circuit simulation, so my edges are actually called wires here. But the idea in Legion is that you can describe any old subset you want. You can describe exactly which pieces, which elements of something you want, and then Legion can take care of moving them around and finding parallelism. Um, and so what are the ones that you want in this case? So if we're going to split up into these three things, um, the first thing we want to be able to describe is we want to be able to describe the nodes that belong to each uh, computing element and, and critically the ones that are going to be private to it, i.e. the ones that they're going to always um, uh, keep local to them. And so I've color coded them red, green, and blue down there. Uh, and as you can see, those are differing subsets of that. But you know, that's not all I need. I need this one also. This is the nodes I'm going to compute that are going to be needed by other nodes when they do their computing. So these are values I'm going to have to share with other people. Um, I also need a list of the nodes that belong to other people that I'm going to use. So this is kind of the opposite of the second one. And you note in some case here, there's, there's some nodes that are actually shared by multiple folks. We're still not even done, though. We need, um, I need to know which wires are going to be computed by which nodes. Um, and then it turns out I need one more thing, which is a, an aggregation of uh, which nodes are private and shared. And basically, the, the shared ones are the ones that are going to have to be moved around in the machine. The private ones are the ones that can stay on one node every time. Uh, and by precisely identifying that, I can keep the data movement in the system to a minimum and get the best kind of scalability that I want from this. So the good news with this is once you describe this, you get a very parallel execution. And data movement is, as I said, as minimal as it can be. There's no other way to get it better. Um, the bad news, well, okay, so I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So region, uh, so region to the language that sits on top of Legion. I actually wrote this in Regent. And it, it can express all these things. I can do arbitrary unstructured data. Um, I can have multiple partitions of the same region. You saw me partition up those nodes three or four different ways. Uh, I can have overlapping partitions that help me describe the cases when multiple um, nodes are accessing the same data. But um, in order to do this, we had to create this opaque coloring object which was this thing that kind of sat outside the rest of the language. Um, that meant the performance of partitioning wasn't great. It's not horrible. You know, it would take seconds to a minute to partition up this circuit, and these simulations tend to run for hours, so it's not bad. But it means you can't maybe do interactive repartitioning or anything like that. Uh, worse, it doesn't scale. So as I go up, I, I, I pay that one cost on the first node uh, at startup every time. Uh, it's not at all easy to use. The code that generated that mess that I showed you on the previous slide is about 159 lines of region code, which I'm, I'm not going to show you. Don't worry. Um, the, uh, the last thing is because it's this 159 lines of opaque application code, I can't statically verify it at all. I, 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 can, I can stare at it, but it's just a mess. Um, you can do runtime verification of a particular circuit, of a particular graph that's loaded. Um, that has cost, and it only works for that one graph. So there's, it's very difficult to say that you've actually um, uh, tested all the cases uh, with, with just a couple circuits. So let's look at what's actually going on here, and, and we'll use that to decide uh, how we can do better. And so if you actually look through those 159 lines of code, what you see is that the code actually started from this notion of, you know, who owns which node in the graph, which is a totally reasonable thing to do. From that, it determined who is going to own which wire in the graph. 
And then it figured out what, wire, what nodes were going to be shared based on who owned which wires. Um, from then, it figured out which are the nodes that are shared, with the basically nodes that are used by more than one uh, compute and, uh, unit. From that, it figured out that private versus shared mix. And then that, uh, plus the first mapping, helped us determine the private nodes by each color and the shared nodes by each color. So I had 159s of gobbledygook. But if you look at it, there weren't that many things going on. It feels like we ought to be able to extract something out of this and, and formalize it and, and apply it to other cases. And so in order to do that, I'm going to talk to you about index spaces and fields. Um, and these are going to be really general terms, and I'm going to try to make it concrete a little bit after it. And so an index space is going to be a set of names of objects. And um, we'll, 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 get to, we'll, get to, we'll get to some concrete choices, but I'm trying to be as general as possible. And a field is basically going to be a mapping from objects to values of some type. So nice and general, let me show you a couple languages that I can map this onto. Uh, the first is pick any old object or any language. You know, uh, new x gives me the name of a new object x. So, so the, the pointers that can come from new make an index space. And clearly, I've got fields uh, defined over objects of this, uh, of this type. So, so fields uh, have the natural meaning here. Um, I showed you the chapel code before. X and Y here are index spaces. They identify uh, names of elements in the arrays F and G. Uh, and then F and G are the fields. They map from uh, one of those indices to a, a value. Um, and then here's regent code, uh, similar to, uh, to the same thing. Basically, X and Y are now regions um, in this language. And I can define a field space, which can have either raw, raw values or pointers to other fields. Um, but so all these things, I've got index spaces, I've got names of objects, and I've got fields. All these three things can be mapped down to a much more mathematical perspective, which uh, we call DPL for the dependent partition language, which is basically just a language of sets and of functions. And in a nice mathematical world like this, with sets and functions, there's a couple things you can do. You can do things on sets, like union and intersection and difference. And you can do things on the functions, like filter, which is basically set comprehension. Or you can compute images of sets and pre-images of sets through these functions. And those are just the standard mathematical image and pre-image operations. So armed with these six functions here, let's go back and look at this picture. And let's put names on things. In particular, we got this first thing from a filter. Just a set comprehension. Tell me the red ones. Tell me the green ones. Tell me the blue ones. This is a pre-image. An image, so mapping kind of backward from nodes to edges, then from edges to nodes. This here is a set difference. Now we have a union, and now we have two intersections. So when we look at this application, plus several others, we see the same recurring pattern of these common operations uh, coming up. You tend to use a filter to compute what we call an independent partition, which is basically the application computed some data, which describes the way it wants to partition it. And because it's just some old data, we treat the function as opaque. It can be whatever the application wants, so it's maximally expressive. But then from that, we have some very easily understood operations that we can apply that tend to compute all the dependent partitionings that an application is going to want from it. And so we're going to get two good things from this. We're going to get, um, uh, it's going to be much easier to use, and it's also going to be analyzable. OK, so dependent partitioning, as I said, is, is a framework. We're going to be, we, we've designed it to be incorporated into existing languages. And so the idea is that parti these partitioning operations I talked about are designed to be added to the host language. Uh, and so they're based on whatever the host language's notion of index spaces and, and fields are. Um, the set of operations we provide have been carefully chosen so that they have straightforward, Im efficient implementations. Uh, and in the paper, you can uh, see some discussion of some other things we chose not to add because we did not believe they could be done efficiently in general. Um, and then any program that's, that uses these dependent partitioning operations can then be lowered into this D into DPL, this, this abstract language. Uh, and it abstracts away the individual objects and actually all the computation of the fields. It just looks at the, the sets and, and the functions as uninterpreted functions. And then we can perform static analysis on this DPL equivalent. And so the proof of concept we show in the, in the paper is a regent implementation. Um, I actually think that Chapel would be a really attractive target for this as well. Um, C++ not so much because it's lacking a bunch of the other things you need for distributed computation. But the idea is that it's, it's a general enough one that can be used in multiple places. So let me talk a little bit about the static analysis, and then I'll get on to the performance and ease of use uh, things that we wanted. Um, 
So uh, you can, uh, the language also includes the ability to add assertions. In some cases, these assertions come directly from the type system of the language. So for example, regent, uh, you don't have to add the assertions yourself. It was actually captured in the regent types. Uh, but you can add them manually uh, in other languages. Um, and the, the neat thing we find is that many times, in fact, most times in, in the applications we looked at, these assertions can be statically discharged. Uh, and the nice thing about this is this guarantees that your partitions are consistent for all possible inputs. Way better than just testing on you know, the handful of graphs you happen to have handy. And so the way this works is we take the DPL version of the, um, of the program, and I've written it here with a syntax that's a little bit easier to use, but basically it's one-to-one -one with that map I was showing you before. And each assertion in it, I can convert to a gigantic formula uh, in, um, in first order logic. Um, and basically, if this formula is satisfiable, it means there is some, there is some counterexample to the assertion I'm trying to make. And so basically what I want to do is I want to check satisfiability of this. Uh, you know, this is a, normally a tool for an SMT solver, uh, but it's important to stop and check whether you think the SMT solver is going to have a good day or not. Uh, and in particular, um, this is a pretty gnarly chunk of first order logic. Uh, it has nested quantifiers. It has negation. It has uninterpreted functions. It has integer arithmetic. All things that uh, kind of, all those kind of individually raise red flags, and we're going to do them all together. Um, and you know, it's not just because we want to; it's because we actually need to to get the expressivity we need for both the structured and unstructured cases. Um, we have some things going in our favor, though. Uh, the structure we have here means that there are at most two free variables, which puts us in this uh, subset of first-order logic called FO2, which is which is a good thing. There are also no predicates left in the language. We have uninterpreted functions, but no predicates. And the last thing we have, which is really important, is the structure of the quantified uh, uh, statements. The way that quantifiers get introduced in DPL is, is, is constrained. And in fact, most, um, most uh, statements that get formed are what we call simple. Uh, it's actually a function of the filters. Simple filters have the property that they only kind of look at one field at a time. And what we show is that if you only have simple filters, um, you're in an actually a completely decidable uh, fragment of first order logic. Uh, and we show this by providing a, uh, a SAT algorithm called DPL SAT. And so if you're in this simple logic, uh, our SAT algorithm will basically take your algorithm here and give you a straight up or down vote on, you know, is this, is this clean? Is this always going to work? Or, or here is a counterexample. Um, and so having, having, a, having a sound uh, and complete algorithm uh, is awfully nice. Um, However, if you have uh, what we call a complex filter, basically anything that's going to look at two fields or mix a field lookup with uh, arithmetic is basically instantly Turing complete. Um, so DPL SAT is going to work. Um, you don't give up, though. You, you pick your favorite uh, high performance SMT solver off the shelf, and you throw it at it, and you see what happens. Uh, most of the time, it gives you an answer anyway, because the heuristics are pretty darn good. Uh, but it will occasionally say, uh, I don't know, you know, basically it times out. Uh, there's a couple things you can do in this case. Uh, quite often you can, uh, since you know it's going to be one of these complex filters, it's the problem. Quite often you can monkey around with the assertions and add kind of a halfway step that lets it uh, bridge the gap. But the other thing you can do actually, uh, and I'll show you performance numbers for a moment, is it's not too bad in this world to actually just let it do the runtime test for some of these dynamic cases, for some of these complex cases. If you can boil it down to just this one thing that it doesn't understand, that test is not usually that expensive. Okay. So this is the, uh, the picture of, in all the cases, basically every single case we, uh, in our applications, we're all decidable, um, uh, which is awfully nice. Uh, OK, so let's talk real quick about programmer productivity and performance. Uh, so pro pro produ programmer productivity, uh, you know, ease of use is a hard thing to measure. Um, the way I'm going to do it, which not everybody uh, is fond of, is I'm just going to show you lines of code. And not because I think this is the only way to do it, but because I think the numbers are um, different enough that you'll agree that there's clearly some signal in the noise. Uh, so my 159 lines of circuit went down to eight lines. Uh, my other two applications I used, uh, Pennant and Mini Arrow, both had you know, 86, 96% reduction. And fundamentally what's going on is instead of asking the application to do kind of arbitrary manipulations to some shared data structures, Typically, the, the, the code that you end up with is do this operation, do this operation, do this operation, do this operation. That we haven't found any case. It didn't just boil down to either exactly the operations or one or two operations composed with each other. So not a, not a perfect metric, but hopefully you'll agree it's better than it was before. Um, so then the other thing you have to do, especially if you're trying to sell to the HPC folks, is you've got to show them performance. 
And so what I've got here is I've got the three applications, a couple different problem sizes, and I'm looking just at the time to do the partitioning. I remember I said this, is, this tends to be, in the old case, it was seconds to minutes on a run taking hours, um, which maybe the performance isn't as big a deal, but uh, if we can make it go faster, then we can uh, plausibly uh, look at doing things like inter uh, repartitioning, uh, being more adaptive in our execution. Okay, so the blue bars here are the runtime of the old way of doing it in Regent. Uh, and I've normalized to just the actual partitioning time. The dashed lines above are the time that it would be if you actually did do that dynamic verification. As, a, as you can see, in some cases, it's, it's quite expensive in the old way. Uh, the gray bars are a single-threaded implementation of the new stuff. Um, and the orange bars are if I throw multiple threads at it. Basically, by having well-defined operations that I understand, I can actually have the runtime parallelize it and, and do quite a bit better. Uh, so, you know, 10x, to, 2x to 10x, depending on the application, quite a bit faster. Uh, the other big thing is uh, the scaling. Basically, now I can take, take problems that couldn't even fit on a single node and scale them up to 64 nodes and get, you know, another 20x uh, performance boost. Uh, and so the numbers here, you know, we're talking about a couple seconds to partition a mesh with a billion elements in it. That's pretty good. I can, I can do that multiple times in a run and still, uh, and still have that not be a big deal. Uh, I'm really short on time, so I'm not going to go over all the related work. One of the things I really liked about this uh, project was that it interacted with all sorts of cool stuff from all sorts of different areas. Uh, this feels like an area that uh, can definitely learn from and teach other folks uh, some things. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, dependent partitioning is a framework that's designed to be incorporated into existing languages. The idea is to still allow this maximum expressivity for independent partitions, letting people get the parallelism and the data movement minimization that they want. But at the same time, it provides operations for computing the dependent partitions that are easy to use, statically verifiable in most cases, and efficient and scalable. And so with that, I will take any questions.